Good morning, and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am delighted to have as my guest, Chad Hollister. How are you, Chad? Wonderful, Melinda. It's nice to see you. I, lo I love your uh, I love your smile. I love your red glasses, uh, your shirt, uh, everything. You, you got it going on. <laughs> well, I dressed up for you, Chad. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for being on my show. I've been meaning to interview you for a long time. So let me tell my viewers a little, just a little bit about you, because we have a lot to cover. You have a long and, and historic career. Chad Hollister is an Americano rocker singer songwriter with the Chad Hollister Band. Now, um, you are the son of a preacher man. Yeah, and I, I actually told that to Joan Osborne when I was auditioning for her band in the a New York City elevator. She didn't think it was very funny, though. <laughs> but well, I, yeah. I think it's great. And you were you you actually were the child of a Presbyterian minister. Uh, growing up here in Vermont, just off of North Avenue in Burlington. Talk to us about that, about your childhood growing up in Burlington. Well, so we grew up on North Avenue. So that the North Avenue Alliance Church uh, was where I used to ride my um, champagne sparkle uh, Schwinn banana seat bike. And so that was my backyard. Uh, as you get off the beltway there, um, that church obviously wasn't there, but the building next to it, was um, the bigger building was our house. And then the building attached to it, which used to be a, a, a TV repair shop, became our church. And my dad, uh, Reverend Bill Hollister, was the very first Presbyterian, uh, started the very first Presbyterian church in all of New England. And what's so funny is I just found this nugget of information out um, from my mom, because I don't know what, you know, people from our past always will come out to gigs or say, you know, I knew your dad or your dad married us or, uh, you know, I knew your mom and dad. And, and um, so that is amazing to me. So he was after he graduated from Union Theological Seminary uh, post Williams, Co well, Williams College in 1951. And then after Union Theological in New York City moved um, to Vermont and the presbytery was really curious as to if it would work. So they went door to door before he started Christ Church Presbyterian right there on North Avenue to see if people would be interested. And there was a strong interest for a Presbyterian church. So uh, the, the, the rest is history. That was our church for, gosh, um, a hand of many years before we moved up to the UVM. Dad moved the church up to UVM campus to what was St. Anselm's next to the uh, Newman Center. Um, uh, uh, next to the music building up um, kind of above uh, Patrick Gymnasium. And then that was our church for many, many years before um, then dad moved on um, and they kept it going and then they lost the lease and so on. But yeah, I mean, growing up, um, this is a long winded answer. Thank you for your patience. Um, but uh, is was amazing in the church because it taught me so much about community and, um, in terms of the religious aspect, I did. I was not crazy about it. <laughs> I I did not. I mean, I had. I was a little hockey player. I was never very good, but I loved hockey. And mom would take me to, down to Letty Park at four o'clock in the morning, literally, for practices because that's when the ice was cheap for Baja. Um, and uh, and I just, but I do remember and still remember to this day. Um, the beauty of community, which is really what I've built my whole music career on is, is community. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, there's, you know, the whole fan thing, you know, they're fans. It's, it's um, more like friends slash community than fans, you know, fans, I always think has just such a weird connotation to it. Um, but uh, I, I, I've, been doing it for 35 years full time since I graduated from UVM and, and uh, dating myself now, but 91. And um, so it's bad. You, you, you were probably a little boy when I first met your dad. I met Bill Hollister when I started my work on the Burlington waterfront. And your, oh, wow. dad, your dad was a community leader. I mean, he was, well, on sure. lot, he was on a lot of committees. He was involved yeah. in the growth of the city and church yeah. street marketplace. He was a, your is your, is your dad no longer with us? Yeah, no, we lost dad 20 years ago. So he oh, died from right. cancer back right. just oh. the year oh. before we were, my wife and I were married. Um, right. But what but, a but, what a 
great man. What a great, great man your father was. And he was involved in every aspect of our community, from city politics to the sure. religious, into, into social services with, you know, right. Eric Stewart. I mean, he was, so anyway, your your father was, a, was an icon in Burlington and you're his son. And I didn't, I apologize because I didn't put that together. So mm -hmm. now I have it together and you even look quite a bit like your dad. So I see you. Yeah. I see you. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, of course, BEAM, the Burlington Ecumenical Action Ministry uh, that Lee, Lee Terhune ended up taking over. Um, Lee was um, stayed with my family when she was young um, because she needed she needed some some help and, and was part of our family is still part of our family. And now look at her. I mean, she I mean, all of you look at you. But but your father was an extraordinary human being. And I'm and I'm so honored to have his son on my show today. Ah. So so talk to us a little bit about your early days in the music scene here mm -hmm. in Vermont and how you got your, your start. So um, I was in church and a buddy of mine, Bill Brooks said, Hey, I know this guy, Jeff Wick, and he's a guitar player. And so um, I was like, cool, well let's jam. So after church on a Sunday, we, uh, I had my drum kit in the car. Mom, of course, drove me to, um, uh, let's see, where did we go? Uh, we went, um, which house did we go to? Uh, I think we went um, to 141 Dale Road where Jeff Wick's uh, mom, Cece Wick, lived. And we jammed for the first time uh, at 141 Dale. And... Um, and I just, you know, Jeff and I hit it right off and we started a band. Um, we, we were called the Blue Rock Band. We had a banner and everything. <laughs> and uh, and it was Jeff Wick and it was Paul Jaffe, um, formerly of The Pants. Um, and uh, of course, that was many years later with Tom Lawson and all those guys. And then we had um, J.P. Preso was on the bass and Steve Fortner uh, was on keyboards. And so we had this band um, and John Barry came in. We had member, members kind of come and go, but we uh, would rehearse down um, uh, on the Burlington waterfront. Um, I can't, JP, the Preso family owned these five condos and we would rehearse in one of the little shacks um, right in front that was owned by JP's parents. So that kind of started the music and I was a drummer. So I, I was not only the drummer, but I was the lead singer. So in the blue rock band, um, uh, this will tell you something about the time. We, we performed um, a gig at uh, Lyman C. Hunt Middle School. And our set list was um, <laughs> Hotel California, uh, Eric Clapton's Cocaine, <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad. Uh, just what I needed by the cars. Um, I love rock and roll by Joan Jett. Uh, and um, and I think that was it. There may have been one more song. And what do you do when the middle school crowd goes crazy and you don't have any more songs? Well, Melinda, you do it again. <laughs> so we performed this end again. And then we we performed over at South Burlington Middle School as well um, for the lunchtime set. Um, and there was nothing cooler. And that just um, birthed my uh, my love for rock and roll and for drumming and for singing and for um, camaraderie with band members and learning how to, um, I mean, being in a band teaches you so much about life it's kind of like being a waiter or a waitress or a bartender because you have to you have to deal with each other um you have to uh once you start getting gigs you have to deal with the money you have to deal with the equipment you have to deal with the travel and at that point it was our parents driving us around so I, anyway so that was really my beginnings um uh, so with with jeff wick and jp preso and cc wick and, is, uh, is a good friend of mine i mean that's i'm just all these names are coming back to me from my past. So this is so wonderful. CC was so amazing. And I think that's the thing is like band moms and band dads like had to be like chill, you know, and 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 if they weren't, you probably that member was out of exactly. <laughs> we, so Chad, we, where, yeah. where did where did you inherit and develop your musical abilities and especially your songwriting brilliance? Where did that come from? 
Um, well, so my mom uh, was has was sing has been singing. Mom's ninety two now. She lives in Peabody, Mass. Um, and she was always singing from age three. She was always in chorus. So there was always uh, with mom uh, at the piano and my sister Kip um, played piano and played the flute, played a little acoustic guitar. So those were the two musical folks in my family. My father was completely tone deaf uh, and would attempt to sing harmonies in church. And Kip and I, my uh, I, I would, you know, we would make fun of dad. Sorry, pops. Uh, and, and my goal, um, it was to make my sister pee her pants because when she would laugh so hard, uh, she would pee. Um, so sorry, Kip. Um, but, uh, so and your so mother, so your mother is where you, um, where you, uh, developed your musical talent. So talk to us, let's move right into the Chad Hollister band. It, it, you, mm. you obviously hail from Vermont and yes. you have been touring the country for over 30 year, years. Talk to us a little bit about how y'all came together to produce well, the music that you create or how you so, got to the band. Yes. Yeah. So when, when the bands kind of split apart after, after high school, you know, the Imaginates um, and, and I, I took a, an up with people show group year in the middle of college. And then when I came back from that, I, um, I knew that I, I wanted to finish college because everybody was like, ah, you're never going to go back. I went back and finished my degree at UVM. And then Jeff and I started a, a, a duo, um, Chad and Jeff. So we toured around New England and and then Jeff decided that because we made a, a, an album at White Crow where um, everybody from Alice Cooper to Fish recorded Picture of Nectar at White Crow on um, on Marble Avenue there off Pine Street. Uh, Todd Lockwood is still a dear friend of mine. I, just, inter I just interviewed Todd a couple oh, of weeks ago. Yeah. He's amazing. We've had some photography sessions and Tom Walters was our engineer and they they were giving this amazing rate of 500 bucks a day. And so we um, we seized that um, that deal and went in and made a record. And it was great. You know, we it, fun, great experience, an amazing studio and and the sounds and so on. But because we didn't um, Jeff uh, Wick thought we were going to, you know, make a record, get signed and become famous. Uh, no. So we, um, Jeff went on to law school, still a dear friend to this day, actually helped us close uh, this home uh, and is, a, is a, an attorney. Um, but uh, we, um, I knew that I wanted to still make music and I knew that I was guiding more towards original music than covers because Jeff and I would do about half and half. We would play every Wednesday at Ruben James, uh, RJ's and just pack the place and have a blast. Um, and so I knew that if I was going to continue, I wanted to do my own songs. And I knew that if I was going to bring them to the world, I was going to choose my choose my favorite musicians in the world. Uh, and at that time, uh, John Carlton that I had met playing with the Martin Gigi band, who is still a dear friend to this day. Martin and I um, are are very close. I was in Martin's first movie wedding band as the crazy lead singer. Real and stretch. It, and his recent movie is just I mean, M Martin's amazing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So go ahead, continue. I just had to so continue. so John Carlson and I were friends, and I said, "Hey, you know, dude, do you want to do this?" He said, "Of course." And Tom Carvey on the bass, um, and Sean Harkness, amazing Wyndham Hill recording artist and dear friend that was with this uh, band called um, uh, Gravity. Uh, geez, I'm crow, not Fighting Gravity, but um, Zero Gravity. Uh, and so that was the original quartet of, and, and right then we we just called it Chad. Um, <laughs> and so our, our logo was the international sticker that just said Chad on it, like it, you know, ACK for Nantucket or all those, you know, the, the international stickers that you see on cars. And, uh, so that really was the, the birth of it. And, and it, it, we went on, we traveled, um, kind of throughout new England, um, had kind of members come and go, um, on, on guitar and on drums and on bass. And, um, and then the band grew and we picked up another member of Zero Gravity, Chris Peterman, um, who is our horn leader. And so we grew to from like a four piece to a nine piece. So we added percussion, then we added three and four horns with Chris Peterman uh, as our kind of horn guy. And Chris and I would get together and write the horn parts. And so now the, the, the band is just monstrous and, and incredible sounding. And uh, that's what you see on the Live at the Ford or um, um, or uh, at the Spruce Peak show. There's um, uh, a couple of shows from like 2016 uh, live from Spruce Peak. Um, so yeah, that, it's, that's really yeah, the, the- The music is amazing history. and what an incredible group of people. But what, so what does it mean, Chad, when they say Hollister's music is pure sonic alchemy? 
Well, that's a quote from Anthony Resta. And and Anthony, I would say, was was one of my favorite producers that I've worked with. And I've worked with some greats um, uh, from Charlie Midnight that wrote Living in America for James Brown for Rocky IV to John Alasia that produced uh, my life record that wrote Dave, you know, produced Dave Matthews and John Mayer, blah, blah, blah. But Anthony, um, there was a real friendship that we had. He was in Chelmsford, Mass. at the time and had this really cool way of recording, which was really organic. Like you would just walk in and it was just a big room with guitars everywhere, um, different kind of setups, no like closed in booths. Like we would create the vocal booth. We would, you know, create the guitar booth or whatever. And it was just kind of this open room. And his uh, engineer still to this day, they're out in Los Angeles now is Cariotti Sutasia, who's just a genius. And so Anthony really was a fan of my music. And that was always, I think a big thing for me with producers that I would choose is um, I never wanted that producer that would be like, hey, I'm going to make you a star, kid, which, you know, the whole L.A., New York City vibe is so um, typical in the music business, especially when you're younger, you know, come on, kid, you know, and then nothing ever happens. Um, and I think the misnomer with me was that in working with these producers, I always I always thought that these producers were going to take me to their people and 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 put me in front of uh, the golden goose and and then I would uh, wrap my arms around the goose and we'd fly away. Um, no. And anybody that, uh, you know, I've seen you interviewing my friends, which is why I, I, I found you and so excited that I did, is that it's so much hard work. Um, and, and I, unlike a lot of my friends, I've been doing it full time for 35 years um, and raising a family, you know. Yes, you have. So um, you... Um... So you have been called one of Vermont's most established musicians. And I'm going to have you talk to us a little bit about some of the amazing national talents that you've played with. Uh, you opened for Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, and Tom Petty, and you shared the stage with every Fish member. Um, mm -hmm. Your music has been hailed as the voice of the positive. Talk to us about some of the amazing national talents that you've played with. Well, we got lucky. I mean, I had a fan, um, Laura, um, can't even remember Laura's last name, but she's not going to see this, I don't think. Maybe she will. Uh, and down in Florida, we would tour down to Florida because we would go where our, we would tour where our family was. And my brother's wife's brother lived in Vero Beach and uh, and she was from Delray Beach. And so it's like, hey, do you want to tour Florida? I'm like, yes, I do. So we would just start playing down there. And then we, people would come out and, and I met Laura at one of the clubs and she called me one day and she ran the, what was called then the Coral Sky uh, Amphitheater in uh, West Palm Beach, which is on the Florida State Fairgrounds um, property and beautiful amphitheater. And she said, hey, I have some shows for you. And I said, oh, you know, cool, well, you know, what? And I wondered if you wanted to open. And I said, well, what are they? And she said, oh, well, I've got Santana and I've got uh, Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, uh, I've got Tom Petty, and meanwhile, my, you know, I was on a phone and, and my jaw was, ah, and, uh, and I saw my question was, well, how many can I do? You know, let's uh, how um, I'll do them. And she said, well, you can pick two. So I picked uh, Bob Dylan and Paul Simon. And then I picked Tom Petty. And because the money, you know, I think it was like 250 bucks, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, opening slots. And we were, you know, we were, the amphitheater was here and we were at, on the stage outside as people came in um, to the amphitheater. And, um, and so I, um, for the uh, Bob Dylan, Paul Simon, I did that solo. Um, but then for the Tom Petty show, I hired my friends out of Gainesville, Florida, Big Sky, and they backed me up. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was incredible. Um, just those experiences and, and, um, so my you know, husband, around, yeah. I so yeah, I just want to share with you that my husband's family's uh, moved to Vero beach and lived there for 30 years. So Vero beach is such a cool town. So yes. that's fascinating. It doesn't surprise me that you played with these greats because you're a great. Now your sound has a very strong bass and a deep rhythm that just perpetuates the desire to stand up and dance, to groove, to move. So where do you get that soulfulness in your songs? Does it come from a little bit of your dad's Presbyterian vibe or your mother's gift? Well, or I, I think it's soulful? really it's really clear. It comes from me being a drummer. A drummer. So there so I'm are. first and foremost, like I always wanted to play drums. So mom, I was in the Vermont Youth Orchestra as a kid. Um, I worked with Carolyn Long, who is one of my dearest 
like she was such a champion of mine and, and was one of the kind, like she could be so mean in getting stuff done. And, and, but I, she always had a soft spot for the Chad, the percussionist. Um, and I tried, mom said I had to play a real instrument before I could play the drums. <laughs> so I, I, I play, I tried the cello and I sucked and I tried the violin and, and Carolyn was my teacher and I would come in at, uh, at the at South Burlington Central School, uh, which is now I don't know what it is. I think it's the DMV, and um, and I would be playing with the donut that you would put your cello into and, and throwing against the wall. And she'd say, "Chad, you didn't practice, did you?" And I'd say, "No, I want to be a drummer." Um, so anyway, I short story long, I I won and I became um, a drummer, and that was my roots really and my story. Um, what most people remember from South Burlington uh middle school high school and even into college was me as a drummer um, and you took up guitar right you took up yeah guitar. so so then one, once chad and jeff uh split up i was on hand percussion with jeff and um we did that just post uvm so like 91 through 94 we were traveling around new england and playing gigs in burlington um and uh i knew that i wanted to front the band but i didn't want to do it from the kid or from behind congas so um i taught myself guitar and um and, you know, I do it in my own way. You know, I have lead guitar, Jeff Peremsky, Primo, we call him as my lead guitar player and he's my hero. Um, uh, it just makes me sound better. We do a lot of duo gigs. So, yeah, that's uh, but I, I do think to get back to your question, it really is that core of the groove comes from me being a drummer. Drummer, um, the bass, because your music it just has. Now you've been fo now you have been focusing on taking fewer gigs and having your gigs mean more. As you oh, said yeah. in an interview with Vermont Standard, uh, what do you mean by that? Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I, I back in the day, and I and I say that, you know, when, as my kids were growing up, I was the only one working. So my wife was home with the kids and she knew Katie O'Rourke is my wife. She's a, a, a artist and a painter. She's amazing and teaches and so on. And But that's only been for six years now. So when we had kids, I was the breadwinner. So every gig that came through, I would have to take. And, um, and that was fine. But there were some gigs that we call uh, a little bit soul sucking, um, like at some of the some of the ski areas that we would do, you know, you'd have to friggin you push the chili and, and the kids with their boogers and the helmets and the French fries and the popcorn off your stage and be like, uh, and and then you get up there and no one would give two craps about you and your original music, you know. And uh, but then there was always those nuggets, you know, that 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 made it worthwhile. But those those gigs were sometimes really tough, and sometimes the uh, you know just the corporate gigs that that might pay better, um, uh, but just no one cares. Um, and you're uh, all about soul, so that yeah. would not resonate with you. So so these days uh, we're we're finding gigs that mean more where we can connect with people so much of what we do these days are house concerts where we come into your home we set up a pa uh and i say we it's you could be solo or my primo and myself acoustic duo and play in your backyard or play in your living room and get to hang with you get to meet have a meal with you talk about whatever you want to talk about not just us but hear about you and your you know what you do and your passions and then play music and tell the stories behind the song. So it's not the grueling of touring, which we've done, where you you arrive to a city, you set up, you sound check, you eat, you do the gig, you pack up, you go to the hotel, uh, go to sleep, and you do it all over again. Um, Chad, I'm, I'm just so you know, I'm going to put you in good company. I'm reading the biography on Beethoven, and his uh, life, his life was spent in people's living rooms playing and, t and telling stories. So you're you're in good company because that's how they used to do music back in, you know, the 1700s, the 1800s. Right. Talk to us. Um, so thank you for that, for that uh, perspective. That was important. Um, you focus on family, love, community, and positivity in your music. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, it really all comes down to family. Like, you know, <clears throat> the, the kids are 17 and 19. So to think that they've they've grown up with rock and roll. They've grown up backstage. They've grown up in kitchens of clubs. They they've grown up in theaters. They've grown up, you know, having to really deal with people. Um, and so family really is first. Um, 
and community is everything. You know, we we've built this amazing community through 35 years of music and 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 with Vermont is is our brand um because it's I think it says so much about us as a band to be from Vermont. Um, well, my I next just, question, my next question was, how has Vermont impacted your songwriting? Oh, it's everything. I mean, you know, we we had a much better view before when I was on my iPhone, but I'm I'm we're in the we're on the hill on a mountain up here in Worcester, Vermont, um, eight miles north of Montpelier, and this is where the kids have grown up. So, um, you know, to go out on my deck and sip coffee in the morning and just stare at the trees um, makes it all worthwhile. Um, but uh, yeah, so come up, so community um is everything and, and they've helped my you know through covid i jumped online and was on facebook live with my family around me and the the connectivity stunk because we're in the hills and nobody cared nobody complained and people would give us money and we survived and there were weeks where i would make two thousand dollars through 2500 bucks through a, a live stream and then there were weeks where i would make zero and so i would apply for for um unemployment and and that was i was really thankful for that but um so yeah and connecting a uh, uh, community and then positivity i just think i, I um there's too much uh, emphasis too much negativity out there i mean look at where we are right now in our in the state of our world and i don't focus on any political element at all i stay clear of it because it for my shows i want to bring people i want to have people forget about everything for a couple hours and, and you just, do that and you and well, you do that and so my to my viewers i just want to let them know that they can learn more about you at www.chadmusic.com and you can mm -hmm. read all about chad you can learn about his events um when, when is, just tell us when your next event is coming up so my viewers know that if they want to. Well, of course. So when's this coming out? So I don't. Oh, it's going to come out. It's going to be out for the next couple of months. But um, and we don't really need to talk about that because it is going to be out for them. So and we're coming to the end of the show. But I want to ask you this because yeah. you got into it just a tad, Chad, mm -hmm. just a tad, Chad. How do you see our world today? And what words of wisdom do you have for younger generations trying to navigate climate change? the threat to our democracy and all the other issues that are facing them and your children who are now uh, young adults. Well, I just think we're in peril. And I think that the, you know, our generation, my kids, their kids are really going to have to step up because climate change is real. Um, our democracy is, is in the gutter right now with both parties. Nobody's coming together. I think we really, as a nation, we need to come together. And I really want to be proud to be an American. Um, and and I, I still am, but to think that there is half our country voting for a felon um, is just crazy to me uh, and, and wanting, wanting that. And I do, I, like I said, I steer clear of it, but I can't, I can't steer clear of that. Um, and I just feel that we need to focus on, on families, on love, on, um, uh, on having our own choice with our own bodies, you know, I'm get. I, of course I'm getting into the issues now, but it's so important. My daughter, you know, it, it's so important. And I think that they really need, our kids really need to step up think, and really at, need to have they, a voice and need to vote. They do. My but, gosh, but think that's about my, my but Think about my generation. Think about the incredible music that came out of the late fifties, sixties and seventies. Yes. That was revolutionary. That yeah. changed the hearts and minds. I mean, yeah. think of those incredible musicians who wrote the music, you know, that basically changed our generation and, and fueled the revolution for civil rights, women's rights, disability rights that, that our generation, you know, fought for. And it was the music that raised right. us up to do that. Music is a way to change the world. Yeah. And, and so yeah. in that, um, I wanted to ask you again, what do you see as the silver lining, the bright light, the hope and dreams? for our humanity? I think it's love. I think it's family. I think it's community. Yeah, you're right. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I would like to see a little bit more music created that helps to change the world a little bit. I think we're seeing sure. it a lot of rap and hip hop. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm friends with, uh, with uh, Peter Stuckey's daughter, Liz Stuckey. And so Peter, Paul and Mary, 
and Joan Baez and 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 Woody and Arlo, um, you know, we're 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 exactly who you're talking about. We're voices for change. Oh, and still I, Nash and Young, you know. Gosh, yes, exactly. Um, and I I think I think that really you know the advocacy and 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 the songs for change really need to continue to come out and people need to gather gather together and and kind of let everything go i think the more that we work together instead of apart this whole this side of the aisle and this side of the aisle and all that crap is just i get there's always going to be these sides but i think it would be so much better if we just had a a unified party that that happening. had had helpful debates i think you it's know, happened. i think it's grown up yeah grown up debates don't you yeah. think we're seeing a move to a political vibe that's a little bit more inclusive and I'll put a sure. in my cabinet and a little bit more. It's all about you, not about me. I think we're moving there. I think we're done with all this stuff. So for your, cause you're coming into leadership. You're out. I hope you don't, how old are you? I'm 56. Okay. So you're, you're not, you're, you're my son's age, a little older than my son. Your generation is coming into power. Um, and it, it should have come into power probably 10 years ago. And your mm. generation was kind of held off by an older generation that just didn't want to move aside. And now's your time. And so you're going to have a voice in all that, Chad Hollister. I just want to remind my folks that, uh, on this call, on this uh, interview, that they can find you on Spotify. You are on mm -hmm. Spotify now. Um, I, I am, but I will just briefly say to know that a million spins on Spotify makes me maybe, which I will, I don't know if I'll ever achieve, makes me maybe $1,700. I know. So, so, so how do people so, find your music other than well, the best way to? they can support any artist is to go for me, go to chadmusic.com and buy my music. Perfect. That is, that right. is the best way. And and to hire me for a gig in your backyard or hire me for a custom song or or the, those are the ways to support artists these days. So we I really always make people aware. I mean, Spotify is great because it helps people that would never find my music, find my music. But the true way to support an artist is to buy. My to husband's purchase. bought all of his music. I mean, he's been doing, you know, iTunes or whatever for and he owns he always brags about how he owns, you know, 80,000 songs. And I'm like, God, is that where all our money went? But anyway, um, so I, I agree. Thank you for that. Also to go to your website, um, yes. chadmusic.com to learn mm -hmm. more about Chad, to follow your band on Facebook because it's a great site and you have all of your gigs up on Facebook and social media uh, and get into the groove with the sonic alchemy of Chad Hollister and his band. So um, uh, to my viewers, is there anything else that you'd like to share with my viewers before we sign off here, Chad? Just make sure you, when you're in life, whatever you're doing, that you love it. I think it's just, it's so evident that Melinda and her husband um, are doing, making change and doing something that they love. And I'm doing something that I love. And I just think that creates an energy from us into the world that, helps the world be a better place. I mean, the music is an extra bonus, but if you're doing something that you love, you know, teachers, gosh, thank you, teachers. Uh, please, we need we need great teachers. Uh, and, and and just really follow follow a passion that you've always wanted to. I think so many people don't are like, I, I can't or I, I shouldn't, or uh, but it's not enough money. Don't worry about the money. Do something you love and the money will follow you. But well, you are such a beautiful man and your, your sonic alchemy just, it fills my heart and fills the people, really fills the people who listen to your beautiful music. And it is so rocking good. And oh, just, you, you. want to get up and just groove and get off your feet and feel the soul of the, the deep bass that you have in your heart. It's beautiful music, Chad. Thank you for your time, my friend. And thank you for being with me today. Thank you, Melinda. And just, I will add that we are at the Woodstock Town Hall Theater on Indigenous Peoples Weekend, Friday, October 11. That's a great one with all nine of us. And so that's going to be a killer one. Fantastic. Please come. Okay. And to my viewers, as always, I'm so delighted you joined me today with Chad Hollister. And I hope to see you again soon. And I ask that you have a beautiful day today. Thank you. Bye-bye.